السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies, and our uh, G uh, Secretary General, Dr. Saud Sarhan, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to um, uh, a great lecture by, our, uh, by an authority in his field, Professor Egius Dionysius. Dinosius Egius, sorry about that. Um, uh, uh, he will uh, lead us or take us into a delightful journey, uh, historical journey of the road to China. Uh, b before uh, I, I introduce uh, our uh, lecturer, I'd like you, uh, to ask you please turn your uh, cell phone onto sil you know, silent uh, and uh, uh, now, this evening, it's a great pleasure, really, and honor to introduce to you Professor Dionysius Igius. He's a fellow of the British Academy and Professor Emiratus uh, al Qasimi uh, of uh, Arabic Studies and uh, Islamic uh, mat Material Culture at the University of Exeter. He's also an adjunct distinguished professor at the King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. He was educated uh, in, Be uh, in Beirut in St. Joseph uh, uh, University in Lebanon, and then later he received his uh, doctorate degree from uh, uh, University of Toronto in Canada. Professor Egius is an ethnographer and a linguist. Uh, his focus is on the Islamic uh, material culture and the people of the sea in the Western Indian Ocean. He's the author of several books and articles, but I will just say the names of uh, some of them. One, the first one is Seafaring in the Arabian Gulf and Oman, People of the Dao, um, uh, published in uh, 2009. Uh, the second one, In the Wake of the Dao, the Arabian Gulf and Oman published in 2010, and Classic Ships of Islam uh, from Mesopotamia to the Indian uh, Ocean, published uh, in 2014. His forthcoming book is on the life of the Red Sea Dao, uh, a cultural history of the seaborne exploration in the Islamic world. Uh, it's expected to be published in uh, this year, uh, 2018. Uh, yeah. Voyages beyond the Western Indian Ocean would, would have not been lightly undertaken. The journey was dangerous as this presentation will unfold. Sailing as far as China and returning to Seraf, the main port on the Iranian coast, at the time in medieval Islam was an accomplishment. Considering the many difficulties and mishaps the sailors encountered. Buzurk ibn Shahriyar, a story compiler of the third century Hijri, ninth century, reports here about one remarkable sea captain, Abhara, when voyaging to China. No one has done it without an accident. If a man reached China without dying on the way, it was already a miracle. Returning safe and sound was unheard of. I have never heard tell of anyone except him, Abhara, who had made the two voyages there and back without mishaps. This statement is true of its kind, according to the geographers. A voyage as far as China would have been hazardous, and many were those who experienced shipwrecks and other calamities. <clears throat> this evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, 
I will be taking you on a voyage into the maritime past to meet those seafaring people, crew and passengers who braved the seas and traveled the Indian Ocean as far as the seas of China. Knowledge and experience were the primary factors braving these seas. But when disaster did strike in their moments of despair, prayers were said invoking the divine. One such recited by the travelers under the patronage of Ashadli goes as follows. Guide us, O Allah, and deliver us from the hands of the evil doers and grant us a fair wind. The main incentives to travel in medieval Islam were trade, pilgrimage, and search for knowledge. Indeed, the Prophet Muhammad is reported to have said, seek knowledge even as far as China. Most of the primary Arabic sources speak at length of the route by land, the famous route called the Silk Route. But a number of medieval geographers and historians mention the sea route to China. Here is a map of Ibn Hawqal showing the different land and sea routes drawn in the fourth, <coughs> 10th century. Note, the world is round. As for the Arabic sources, for understanding seaborne trade and navigating the Indian Ocean, they are limited, but can sometimes be rewarding. I mention here a few. Ali Akubi, Ibn Khurradadbe, Ibn Rusta, Ibn Al-Faqih Al-Hamadani, Al-Istakhri, Ibn Hawqal. All fundamental works that they produced and significant in the development of empirical study. Historical works too, like uh, the works of Ibn Al-Mujawir, Abu Al-Fida, At-Tabari, the father of history, Al-Nuwayri Al-Skandarani, Al-Makrizi, and many others. Maps of the 9th and 10th century, 3rd and 4th Hijri, though fundamental to our understanding of the land and maritime networks, are often difficult to interpret. Images of ships or of the maritime context are few due to, due to Islam's prohibition of the reproducing nature in any form of imagery, while underwater archaeology has produced only a few wrecks. Here I need to mention that I have looked at a few Chinese written and iconographic sources in translation, but these are only a few from a large corpus of works in Chinese that exist on the subject of seaborne trade and many need to be discovered and deciphered and studied. <coughs> Drawing on these sources, the following questions are addressed. What were the trade routes to China in medieval Islam? What kind of ship did people sail on? What were its construction features? And how did mariners navigate the Indian Ocean? The outline for this talk will be first to give a background of the trade routes and then the lands and the commodities follow, the maritime network. I will then talk about Islamic and Chinese ships, ship construction technology, navigating the seas, and finally, 
concluding thoughts. Information on routes in medieval Islam was purely for administrative purposes, serving the central government and that of or regional rulers and governors. These administrators, like Ibn al Khurradathbe, in his kitab, in his book, um, uh, 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 the, 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 the Roots, he set out to survey each Islamic province by collecting information. The question is what kind of information? Taxation, obviously. Caravan routes. As this drawing shows, of a caravan at rest by the al maqamat um, written by Al-Hariri and the, paint, the drawings by Al-Wasti. Their surveys contained maps, often accompanied by the historical narrative and travel accounts, which uh, are richly rewarding source of geography, ethnography, and cultural history. The map of the geographer al magdisi on your left identifies today's Indian Ocean. It's not called Indian Ocean, it's called, it's called the Sea of China, from the Red Sea, India, to China. While on your right, Al-Idrisi, a geographer, he gives us perhaps one of the best examples of details. Details in the 12th century of routes, mountains, rivers, seas, and islands. Note that these maps drew the south as what is for us the north, and the north what is for us the south. So according to written and cartographic sources, What were the trade, no, trade routes of the time? First, I would like to mention the Amber Route, which from the Balkans, what is known as East Europe, um, and the Mediterranean Sea, went to the Levant, Levant to Arabia, as the, as the map shows the waterways the Muslim merchants used in search of amber. Ibn Fadlan gives us a very good example of this in, on his route to Scandinavian countries. The gold and salt route across the Sub-Sahara from Mali to the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. This Catalan map of 1375 shows King Mansa Musa traveling across the Sub-Sahara with camels. Camels loaded of what? Of gold, obviously. The Silk Route over <coughs> land was well known from China to the Mediterranean. But it was only also known not only for the silk, but also for the iron, copper, ivory, precious stones, and perfumes. But there was also, as I uh, would like to stress, the Silk Route by sea. From the Chinese coast, from Canton, to the city of Venice in the Mediterranean, passing through the Red Sea, and from the Red Sea to Suez, uh, to, uh, to, to the Nile, Alexandria, and through the Mediterranean, as this adaptation of the Chinese cartog cartography. Apart from silk, textiles, and spices, there were pearls from the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea, much sought by the peoples of the Mediterranean, India, and China. Chinese porcelain was carried to the main ports of the Indian Ocean, and up to the European harbors. Fragments of Chinese porcelain and ceramic are found in a number of port towns in Southeast Asia, 
the Arabian Gulf, the southern Arabian coast, the Red Sea and East Africa, not to mention the West Indian coast. In order to understand the lands surrounding the Indian Ocean, we need to know how medieval Muslim geographers, historians, and travelers classified these lands. East Africa was called the land of the Zanj, the blacks, also for its ivory. India, the land of pepper. The islands of Sumatra and Java were referred to as the land of gold. The Moluccas, the land of spice. Southern Arabia, the land of frankincense and myrrh. Of course, frankincense was for thousands of years much prized for use in temple worship and for household consumption and to deter evil forces, evil spirits. And it was all used and is still used for healing purposes. Muslim merchants with their missionary zeal, followed the paths of their predecessors, the Buddhists and the Hindus from the East. But they also explored newer routes through the desert and the sea, the pilgrimage routes from Mesopotamia and the Arabian Gulf are good examples of the travel network that developed after the rise of, rise of Islam. Consider what was once called the incense road to carry spices, precious stones, and other goods, it became the pilgrimage road. Trading posts inland on the coast were created to form a commercial connection. For example, Seraf and Hormuz in Persia, Suhar in Oman, Aden in Yemen, and Calicut in India. All this en route to China. The du duration of voyages on the Gulf to China, from the Gulf, from the Arabian um, Gulf to China, Muscat, Kulon in, in, in uh, India, Kala um, in uh, <coughs> on the Bengali um, um, coast and Canton were used to take about three months. This was, of course, if you had good winds. But in rough weather, the Chinese traveler Yi Tsing in 713 of the Christian era reports that even a voyage from Ceylon, Sri Lanka today, to Java could take three months allowing time for stopping, um, you know, changing of cargoes, uh, passengers c going up and down, um, disembarking, embarking, and repair and leakage. This all had to be done in stopping places. The return trip was divided by setting off in November from Canton in China to Aceh in Sumatra which lasted something like 40 days, again in good weather. And in January, from Aceh to Aden, which lasted 60 days. So the main ports, as I already mentioned, were Seraf, the main harbor, always cited by Arabic sources, by Chinese sources, by Indian sources. And it received ships from all parts of the Western and Eastern Indian Ocean. Sohar, too, was a very important, uh, um, uh, and Hormuz, as we said, and Calicut. Of uh, about Sohar, Al Magdisi um, says there is not on the Sea of China today a more important town than Sohar. Why? It is the gateway to China. 
the storehouse of the East. By the start of the 15th century, Hormos on the coast of Persia was an international trading center. Chinese annals describe Hormos as a rich port which sent um, ambassadors to China. Ma Huan, 15th century, a Chinese historian, recounts how from every place and foreign country, merchants traveling by land all come to this country to attend the market and trade. Hence, the people of this country are rich. Here it need, needs to be mentioned how trade, how trade fairs were strategically important for the sale of goods from a distant place. As we have today in modern times, uh, we put a lot of emphasis for trade um, between countries. Here is a drawing from the, again, from the Makamat of Al Hariri, 13th century, of a market. It is a trade fair. The trade fairs were set up all around the Arabian Peninsula, from Basra in Iraq to Aqaba in the Red Sea, and the Persian coast, as well as the West Indian coast and East African coast. As for the Arabian, Persian, Indian, and Chinese ships sailing to and from China, we have a number of Arabic sources to consider. But the lack of them is quite significant. Nonetheless, we have the merchant Suleiman at Tajir, the first to record Chinese ships trading with Seraf, the geographer and merchant Al Masoudi, who writes about mariners and merchants of Seraf, as well as, as well as Basra and Oman crossing the Sea of China, Abu Imran Musa, captain who tells stories on Serafi sailors sailing as far as China and heroic uh, stories. And Abu al mahasin the historian, reports of Chinese ships that sailed as far as Aden, trading porcelain and musk. For the Chinese sources, we have the Tang Annals, which give accounts of journeys taken by Chinese merchants from Canton to Seraf. Later, the dominance of Chinese ships in the Western Indian uh, Ocean during the Northern and Southern Song dynasties, as well as the Yuan dynasty. They're well attested. Perhaps the only person to describe um, Chinese ships was Ibn Battuta, the globe trotter of Morocco, of uh, Tanja, T Tangiers. He says, he writes that he stopped at the port of Caligat. Yes, it was the, cross, the, the, the main port to change. And he says that on the Sea of China, traveling is done in Chinese ships only, which suggests that, 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 that um, Caligat was the place where, where people got off and from s smaller ships, Arabian, Persian, or East African ships, or Red Sea ships, and then they changed to the Chinese ships, which were acquainted with the Eastern Indian Ocean. And he describes three kinds, a large, a middle, and a small. And they varied in terms of sails from 12 to three sails. Almost contemporary with Ibn Battuta is the coming of the seven Ming diplomatic uh, expeditions under the commandership of the Muslim Zheng He, which consisted of large fleets of junks of different sizes that sailed from China to East Africa over a period of 30 years. Alas, the voyages ended reasons unknown. But 
the objective was to explore and expand the trade. And that the, 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 what's special about the Ming voyages, or expeditionary voyages, was the appearance of organized de naval forces with junks of great size, not witnessed before, according to Joseph Needham, um, a historian. The Chinese sources describe the junks as having the majestic quality of great mountains. But how true was this? It is a question that has perplexed many historians and both architects. And there is doubt about the enormous size. Going back to the sea routes, there are two main sailing routes in the Indian Ocean described by the works of Chu Gu Fei, Ahmed ibn Majid, and Duarte Barbosa. The meeting point between the two seas of the Indian Ocean was, as I said, um, Calicut and <coughs> Sri Lanka. Calicut, uh, um, uh, once more, was often the midway post where the transshipment of goods uh, took place. And um, on, at the Malabar coast, the, go the goods were loaded onto smaller or medium-sized vessels, like the Arabian Gulf ship that used to do a trip from um, India to the Gulf. This is the uh, Qatari Batil. They returned to their homeland from, from, from India, carrying pilgrims, some of them to Aden or Jeddah on the Red Sea. There again, in the Red Sea, they, 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 the passengers sometimes and the cargo was transferred to smaller uh, vessels which could cope with the coral reefs. We now turn to the principles of navigation in this Indian Ocean. Sailing times are predictable with the seasonal monsoonal winds blowing in different directions changing every six months. They are indeed fundamental to the physical and human unities of the Indian Ocean. Marco Polo, who died in 1323, the Italian merchant and traveler, Ludovico di Vartema, another traveler, Italian traveler and merchant, when they sailed the Indian Ocean, they reported having seen pilots using good charts, indigenous pilots. We know uh, that maritime manuals following the Persian Rahnameh, the tradition of Rahnameh, existed in the 15th century, which Ahmed ibn Majid, uh, 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 sea captain, um, uh, used. Such manuals assist, consisted of star positions, latitudes, bearings, and physical descriptions of land, islands, such as the Nuniya al Kubra, which you see um, exhibited. This is a framework that exists and comparable to the Chinese sailing instructions that survived in the 15th century, the Wu Bei Ji. The medieval pilot was guided by the stars and his primitive instruments. <coughs> Other than that, he relied on experience. But it did not take much for a sailing ship to be driven off course. The intermingling of mariners in the ports of the Indian Ocean meant that there was a cross-fertilization of ideas and technology practiced by the in Chinese, Indian, Arabian, and Persian, and East African, such as the use of the Kamal on your left, um, which, which had um, several knots. It was a rectangular tablet 
attached to knots and it and it uh, were calibrated um, um, along its length. Um, so and this is a way to determine the latitude. Um, but to, to calculate the latitude of the ship, um, they lo used finger breaths, um, as you see on your right. And this is a Chinese um, altitude measurement in Qi, uh, which was adapted practically identical to that of the Arabian and Persian pilots. Then we have got the magnetic compass, whom a lot of us are familiar with. Again, this was introduced by the Chinese. The uh, first mention of it was in 1252, in our, 1282 in our, um, uh, on our side, which is, was a Persian text. So now uh, we come to an important question. What do we know of the medieval ship's con construction in the Western Indian Ocean? But first, what information do we have of shipbuilding yards in the Western Indian Ocean? Again, our Arabic texts are silent. You only have to guess between the lines. There is some, you, you could guess that there is, obviously there was in Basra, in Seraf, in Sohar, since all these texts mention of all the contacts that they had with, 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 with the trade. But that doesn't mean that was the case. But for sure, we know um, that there was, in 1572, according to this um, chart, uh, Calicut was producing ships, um, local ships, Indian ships, as you see on the shore, where the arrow uh, points on the, on the right. And it's interesting also, you see an elephant, an elephant on the shore, what is he doing there? Because the, 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 the image wanted to point out that the elephants from the mountains roll the logs down to the shore to build, cut the planks and build the, the ships. Of course, Calicut was famous for building, shipbuilding for many, many years, hundreds of years, up to this very recent times. I interviewed a lot of shipbuilders in the Gulf and Oman and the Red Sea who used to uh, um, deal with uh, Indians, Keralites. Uh, but now the teak is not being sold anymore. There is a reservation on it. Aden was another place, a shipyard. Here again, the Civitates Orbis Terrarum depicts a building yard at Aden. How large were these ships? Where, how long were they? Uh, how wide? These are all questions that the texts, our Arabic texts, geographical texts in particular, or historical for that, for that matter, are void of information. So you, we have to guess from what the people tell us in the ethnography of the lengths and breadths of today's um, um, <coughs> ships. Weight capacity, the same thing. None of them tell us exactly how, more or less. I know from what uh, my uh, in interviewees told me that they were not more than 300 tons. The ships were stitch planked, as we see from this uh, Makamat uh, uh, image um, with the arrows showing the stitching in that manner on your right. And this is a ship um, found in Oman, on Zofar, in Zofar, and you see the stitching inside of the planks. Of course, they were very solid by stitching, because stitching uh, then expands in the sea, and they become solid, and then, of course, they put um, a ceiling uh, with um, what they call kalfat. Then the remains of a 9th century uh, Indian um, uh, Indian Ocean um, shipwreck at Balatung of the Indian Ocean shows this technique <coughs> on your left and the re reconstruction. But in India, the Kadakapali shows, um, shows n nail planking rather than cord um, planking. So this is interesting that there were two technology simultaneous. And in Kusair al-Qadim, on the Egyptian coast, you found both 
Um, the, unfortunately, uh, the pictures do not uh, show, but you can see the holes and the nails were not available, but you could see the place where the nails were. Again, Rader. We have got pictures about Rader, but not the scripts are, are a little bit vague. Um, but we know from these uh, images uh, that they used um, they used they used a double um, or uh, and then the the axial rudder, which was introduced later. Uh, so, as you see, they were introduced simultaneously over here, but it was introduced later by the Chinese. Um, sales again. <laughs> They don't give us information about about square sail, Latin sail. Square sail, obviously, is, is clear from the Persian miniatures of the Shahnameh, you know, the square sail. They were still using them until the 1930s. The Latin sail came much later. And, uh, you know, this myth of the Arabian uh, sail, um, uh, you know, the triangle sail, or triangle, triangle uh, sati sail, uh, is, 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 is a, an adaptation which didn't come necessarily from the Mediterranean. It could have simultaneously come from Southeast Asia, which was used at the time in the medieval period, late medieval period. Archaeological evidence um, cannot provide all the information necessary to reconstruct a medieval Arabian, Persian, or Indian ship or East African ship. Alternatively, we have the historical texts, but they, however, do not hold much information, as we have seen, nor does iconography, in spite of the availability of few images. So ethnography is one solution. And of, of course, you have to extrapolate of what people tell you and see that, ah, we might have a continuum with the past. But that could be speculative and sometimes maybe dangerous. Iconographic evidence um, uh, can tell us something about comfort on ships. As you see from the, uh, the, the, the guys over here, the merchants, uh, peeping through the holes of the cabins. Uh, it shows that they are ve very well dressed. It's rich. You know, they, these people are, are, had money. And was it always the case? And look at the bailers, you know, bailing water, because a lot of water uh, um, <coughs> comes in the ship and look at the cross stitching of the of the of the dock. A very interesting uh, image, precious, P one of the few. Comfort was not good, and we have to look what Ibn Jubay tells us about comfort on uh, the medium and small ships. He talks of pilgrims. He says they load the ferries with pilgrims until they sit on top on the other as they are the chickens crammed in a coop. Very disheartening. And, and Sailing, the, the medieval traveler risked his life in bad weather, no doubt about it. While the lack of water, sanitary facilities, the cramped space in the hold and deck were enough to make the life of the passengers, but not only passengers, the crews, <coughs> miserable. The, some of the sailors, even up till this very day, I spoke to sailors, they don't, didn't even know how to swim. Damage or loss of, of cargo was common, and theft of cargo was common when in the transshipment. And what passenger, passengers fe, fe, uh, feared most was the loss of their lives through gales and and uh, storms, and, and ships could be wrecked and rocks. Cargo was thrown overboard in that case. And when disaster struck, people lost their lives, and in, in, in sometimes even hundreds. Al Mas'ud tells us about the waves crashing one against the other. The passengers panicked at them as the waters uh, towered over them, so you get the feeling emotionally, you know, psychologically, you know, what it felt, what it what would to have been to be a passenger or a, a member of the crew. Abu Imran al-Sirafi is one 
in one of his stories, tell us the winds were intense and the crew could not understand the orders of the captain because of the noise, crushing waves against each other and the howling of the wind. You can imagine, you know, what, what, how difficult it was to sail days and months, weeks and months if you are going to China <laughs> and if you came back alive. The mast often broke, and that's true, many uh, of the interviews confirmed that. And the, the, the captain inst instructs over here to repair the, the mast, at least temporarily. Piratical raids were rife, and people prayed. They wore the amulets. They performed rituals against the evil eye. Ships carried symbols like uh, this one, um, uh, only recently, which is extinct, of a Kuwaiti Baghla with a parrot shape on the stem post, looking backwards to protect the passengers and the crew. So, as we have seen, uh, one of the greatest incentives for travel in medieval Islam was trade, and often went hand in hand with pilgrimage. It is true to say that seaborne trade, as well as trade through the desert routes, was the wealth, the strength, and glory of Islam. The rapid expansion of Islam in the first centuries strengthened links between the towns of the mainland and the coastal towns from southern Morocco to Canton in China. Pilgrimage accelerated the sea trade as thousands, thousands of pilgrims and merchant pilgrims made their way from China to Jeddah by sea stopping at port towns and traded goods. I'm repeating this because this is very important to sink in how the trade worked through by sea. Sea travel had the advantage of being faster, even though it was dependent on the monsoonal winds, but definitely better than desert crossing where you would, you would be raided by Bedouins. The route to China existed before the coming of Islam. Muslims, like their predecessors, the Buddhists and the Hindus, took their own religion of Islam to the communities they found creating a cosmopolitan, yet to some extent, as it appears, unified trading community with a shared Islamic culture and a common trading lingua franca, a form of Arabic which was universally understood. Until the beginnings of the 16th century, it can be said in some way that the harbors and communities of both the Western and Eastern Indian Ocean enjoyed a much more peaceful commercial coexistence, definitely more than the Mediterranean, which was rife with, with wars between Christians and Muslims. However, when the Portuguese entered the Indian Ocean at the end of the 15th century, things changed. Harbors were attacked. People were killed. Buildings were burned. Forts were built all along the coasts. And the trade became practiced, sorry, was practiced by a pyramid, Carteza. So under the Dutch, so under the British. That harmony, once enjoyed by the maritime peoples of the region, seemed to have been overturned by the new invaders, in this case, the Portuguese. Nonetheless, the interdependence of the various trading activities centered on the sea should not be, it should not be believed to be disrupted entirely. It continued to provide an underlying cohesion for the maritime communities 
so that the long distance trade, which carried on, albeit under Portuguese control, continued to thrive in spirit of the constraint and the invaders. Ladies and gentlemen, I have come to the end <coughs> of my journey. I have communicated my thoughts to you, summed up from my recent three works, <coughs> three books, a trilogy I wrote. They combine written texts, iconography, archaeology, as I have shown it, uh, tonight in a very, very general way, of course, but I included also ethnography, creating a holistic approach to the understanding of the past with the present. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in a few uh, minutes we will open the, uh, for uh, questions. In this regard, uh, it will be one question at a time, will be answered by Professor uh, Agius. Uh, and then please make your questions uh, brief. If you have a comment, also much briefer. But uh, I, I would like to use uh, the, program, uh, the ad, uh, opportunity or the advantage of being a moderator, a colleague of mine use a better word for this, and uh, start with a little comment and uh, a question. Uh, thank you, Professor. It was very uh, great uh, uh, presentation. But uh, it seems to me, and I'm not a, a specialist in this area, but in your presentation, uh, you have given us uh, 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 the highlights of routes to China and the seaborne exploration in medieval, uh, medieval Islam. Uh, is it accurate for me to assume that most of the main data of this vast and complex subject have been uh, captured in your three books that you mentioned? That's one little question. The second one, um, I got some help with this. Uh, why do you think the medieval Arabic text about geography and history lack, generally speaking, uh, information about the maritime trade uh, routes and anything pertaining to maritime uh, while Chinese texts are more detailed and more specific in this area? I was hoping I won't be asked this question. <laughs> absolutely true. And it's very frightening, you know. I was when I started um, studying Arabic texts, and that was quite a long time ago, it was about 30, 30, 30 years at least, if not earlier, and I was naive, I was very excited. I said, oh God, you know, I'm going to find a lot of interesting things because honestly, the, 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 the Arabic of the geography texts is so beautiful, some of it. I mean, uh, just to take example, Al Mas'udi, beautiful floral style and, 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 and so on and so forth. And then when I came to the material culture, which I am interested, when I came to the maritime, I was very disillusioned. And I'm not speaking of al Masudi. I'm speaking of the other um, Islamic text that I mentioned, the long list, even though a few of, of the, uh, they lack information. And this is not only a maritime or other things, but maritime in particular for some reason. There's a lot of information about the land, a lot of information about the desert, the camel, you know, the, 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 the land routes, you know, the imports and exports. But when it comes maritime, it's lacking. Now, the Chinese sources is the other way around. And the way I interpret this, maybe our Chinese um, 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 uh, colleagues here uh, would like to comment. My impression I get is that Chinese sources were precise, where they recorded everything, they documented everything, which Arabs 
uh, uh, sorry, um, I correct that. I, I shouldn't say Arabs because most of the writers, they, they were wrote in Arabic, but they were not necessarily Arabian. Um, the, 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 the Muslim writers um, lacked that, that precision in detail. They had it in other things. Now, that's interesting. Um, this is the same thing with the Ottomans. The Ottomans had precise recording and documentation of things. Uh, it, it's something, you know, a bureaucratic approach, you know, which, which but I, I, I ask, I ask with your permission, who could perhaps help me with this? That's, a, that's an instead of uh, the guests asking a question. Anyway, <laughs> if we don't see any question coming, uh, please, Mohammed, our fellow here in the center. Um, wonderful talk, Professor Agios. I really Thank enjoyed you. it and very visually rich. It's much appreciated. Um, I was thinking actually throughout the talk, and I know the talk was mostly focused on trade routes and the material cultures and technologies associated with it, but a lot of the pieces that you mentioned, the travel logs, uh, with, in relation to the road to China, whether it's um, Suleiman al Tajr or Sayyarafi and others, even Ibn Battuta. A lot of these writings dedicate a considerable portion of their work to describing China itself. Mm -hmm. the administrative practices, the state, its material culture, how it's governed. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, if you could comment on these imaginaries. And two, what did these imaginaries, what was the function of these ima uh, imaginaries in a, discursive, in a discursive sense? And I mean in that when I read them, I always find that there are echoes, for example, with the writings of Enlightenment authors in the 17th and 18th century, where China also occupied a very romantic orientalist position, whereby you know, uh, the, the well-governed imperium is contrasted with the badly governed tyrannical states of, say, France or other ancien regime type orders in Europe. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, did they function in that same way? Or is it just simply that they functioned as gharaibiyat, fantastical storytelling? I'm wondering whether you know, you yes, so that, you know uh, this is a very interesting observation and, 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 and comment and, and question. Uh, the Ajaib al Gharaib, um, which obviously, you know, the, the um, how, how would you translate that? The, the curiosities, no? The, the curiosities. curiosities and wonders, uh, uh, wonders, wonders and curiosities um, that you find in, 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 in these narratives of Buzurk uh, ibn Shahriyar and, uh, and Imran Abu Musa. And um, as Serafi, uh, uh, to, to take your point, he does have um, uh, um, what do you call them uh, descriptions of. Uh, I, I had a student who worked on this. Uh, uh, she was interested in the place names, and that's another another study. Uh, place names because we have got confusion of names. Uh, I'm sure they were accurate, but they are recording um, uh, 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 names of places which were known at the time, uh, but they are not known to us, we lost them, because the lack of recording, I mean, that's a, a study of its own. But the, these narratives of the, uh, of the wonders, and, and, and uh, it's interesting. And why did, they, why did they have these stories of wonders and, and curiosities? It's for entertainment. But these books were not only written for entertainment, they had another, another mission instruction and and as much as that instruction uh, and I, 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 I wanted that information you know the, the technology in particular and, and, and so on and so forth it was lacking so there was there was a question of instruction the moral point what was the moral point was the moral point of this abhara going to China and back alive coming back alive safe and sound you know, is it, is it because it's the union with Allah? God was the insurer, never mind. It's, it's that, that, that religious mission. While the, 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 it's interesting what you mentioned about the, the Chinese sources, about, was it 17th, 18th century narrative? Enlightenment, European. Oh, enlightened, oh, sorry. So I'm thinking about yeah. the comparison. Yeah, yeah. But do you find that in Chinese sources too? No. No, sources, yeah. but I'm just saying, you know, the Arab, the tone of the Arab texts is mm. very similar to off, European authorship about China. 
in the 17th and 18th centuries. Aha, uh -huh. okay, yeah, then, then, that I don't know, and I, I'm, I'm very interested to, to, to know more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any of the ladies would like to ask a question? I have a, a majority of gentlemen, but uh, any other question? Oh, please, <coughs> doctor. Yeah. Thank you very much. For thank you for a beautiful lecture. You mentioned in the conclusion the disruption of harmony in your words that happens with the Portuguese, Dutch, and the European forces came. <clears throat> Would you comment more? Why, why do you think that happened? Because uh, they went all the way in 1500 exactly to Iran introduced at the time the Safawi. The first cannon was introduced, according to what I know, exactly 1500 by the Portuguese. And the whole harmony uh, was disrupted. Why do you think this comes from where? Thank you. Um, the, the question is, uh, the, 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 if you start with the Portuguese, the mission was clear, was military occupation. Uh, you follow what we, we say and that's it, you know? I mean, there's, there's no question about the total, total uh, colonization, you know, from top to bottom. Um, and that disrupted a lot in, in terms of, uh, I, I'm not saying it was, when I say peaceful and harmony, uh, I'm very cautious about these two words. They, they look very magical. Uh, th there was no doubt about it. There was a lot of infighting, tribal wars, uh, you know, I'm sure the Portuguese put things into order in many ways. You know, uh, come on, you know, let's 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 uh, you know live together. But you do what I say. So that there was that element of which is was common. The, the 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 Dutch came and dominated economically, as we know, with with the ships in Mocha. You know, com completely, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, what's the word, um, exploited uh, the coffee trade. And of course, coffee became so important globally. Um, compared to this, we have the Chinese expeditionary forces, uh, sorry, fleet, uh, coming uh, in the 12th, is it 12th or 13th, 13th century, uh, the, the Ming uh, voyage, voyages, 15th, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, we, we, we don't hear of any, any disruption, but obviously there was some kind of imposing, uh, you know, a certain way of trading. Um, uh, Persia, under the Safavite period, was a very g g glowing period, no? I mean, uh, you are aware, uh, I, I'm sure you, you, you ask the question because you are more <laughs> knowledgeable than me about the Safavite period, but it was definitely where, where missionary, sorry, uh, missionaries and emissaries from Europe came to Persia, and, uh, you know, it was a, a, a glowing trade between China and Europe. But it's a, it's a, it's a delicate subject, and uh, the maritime trade needs more studying of texts. Uh, I speak of the Arabic texts and the Chinese texts. There is more and more to be done. But what about the Indian texts? You know, the Sanskrit texts, the, the Hindi texts. You know, there is a lot of information over there which we haven't yet started to think about, to, 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 to study. Any other? Uh, please go. Just uh, two quick questions, please. Regarding the, the Dao's uh, sizes, uh, I'm just just mentioning some, some names like Bagla, like Batil, like, so what was the biggest size? Built by Muslim, uh, by Arabian Muslims in GCC. This is the first question. Can, can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. The biggest size the? of Tao built by Muslims in GCC. The size, in terms of sizes. The th oh, sizes, yes. yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is the first question. The second question about the terminology. Tank, for example, I thought that tank was taken from English, but actually it was taken from 
tank, the uh, reservoir of liquids yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. was taken from Indian language. Yeah, yeah. Well, this came from Daos, the, yeah. uh, the, you know, the, the, yeah. the villages between GCC and India. Yeah, but, uh, and the, the, just, the, just for... So, so it's a question of terminology, no? Terminology, yeah. yes. For example, tank. So yes, it was taken from right, Indian, yeah. tanky. Yeah. It wasn't taken from English. It wasn't borrowed from English. And the third one, which, which is about the, the latitude measurements, was there any, uh, for example, experience exchanges between Arabs, Muslims, and Chinese? For example, Kamal, how was invented? Yeah, it was yeah, invented yeah. purely by yeah, Muslims. Yeah. Yes, or was the, taken, or was it just taken from, from other cultures like China? Yeah. No. From, from, from what, from what, what it can be said. I, I'll, I'll start from bottom top. Um, uh, <coughs> the latitude, uh, the isba, no, the the, the chi uh, method. Definitely, it was borrowed from the Chinese. Um, through th there has been a study. Give him, give him uh, uh, an Arabic name, Kamal. No, no, no. I'm talking of the isba, the, the finger, you know, to to to, to calculate the, the the latitude of the ship with the horizon, you know. Um, and of course, they use the the, the finger, you know, isba. Um, th that method is, is definitely has passed on from east to west. I mean, eastern Indian Ocean to western Indian Ocean. The, the, the Kamal definitely is not an Arabic word, and uh, even though it, it, it sounds like the word perfect, perfection, um, but no, it's, it's a Southeast, Southeast Asian um, but uh, um, uh, uh, most probably, and there has been studies on this, and I, I'm ignorant on this subject of Kamal, uh, is Chinese. Um, in terms of terminology, there is, most, interestingly enough, both building terminology and navigational nautical terminology, a lot of, of it is of Persian origin. Some of it is of Portuguese origin. Rightly so, you know, Portuguese. Um, some of it is English. But this is what makes the language rich. <laughs> I, I, I think it came from Sanskrit. Oh, and some of, it, some of it, yeah, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Sanskrit and Hindi. This is what makes it the, the beautiful language of Arabic, you know, richness of borrowing and adaptation. You know, take the word, for example, a, a Dao, you know, the traditional boat called Baghla which in Arabic means mule. But actually, it's an Indian word, bagalo. <laughs> this has got a different meaning, which I don't ask me what it is in, in Indian. Um, uh, uh, the, the other question was the weight capacity, no? Sizes. The sizes. Yeah. Oh, the sizes of the ships. Yes. What, what, do you know? what do we know? What was the biggest? The biggest? Yeah, the biggest. The, 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 well, we the largest. We, we, medieval Islam, no, we don't know. No, no. no. Oh, okay. yeah. By the way, this is Dr. Sultan al Mujaywil. He's translating one of the books that you have seen. Um, it will be published soon, inshallah. Maybe after six, seven months, I don't know. <laughs> soon will be published. Published by it Kuwaiti Center. So I yeah. hope so, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the lady yeah, over there. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot. Yes, Can hello. you please uh, introduce yourself? Okay. I, I missed that. I know so many girls, but since we are few like this year. Okay, uh, my name is Dr. Al Johara Al Mayman, medievalist uh, historian. Uh, I would like to uh, elaborate uh, regarding the. Uh, the real issue after uh, the crusades of uh, uh, for the European to expand uh, east. Uh, Marco Polo's uh, um, trip, of course, and with his son, uh, he explained uh, a lot about uh, China and uh, what uh, did he saw, uh, did he see there and everything. Uh, and you would like to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, reason, uh, if it's not mainly, but one of the most important reasons uh, is uh, uh, spreading Christianity. And the papacy also 
help with this uh, tool. Uh, and uh, we can uh, uh, have a strong explanation how Christianity spread uh, throughout the East uh, by the, these uh, kind of exploration. I would like to ask you, have you heard about uh, Dr. Khalid Abu Khair when he said uh, in his, uh, uh, um, it's not new, but uh, it's uh, uh, opening the re reality of uh, we as Arab or Muslim uh, were the first to discover America. Uh, uh, b b b talking about the uh, 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 Arab in Andal Andalusia, Spain, and also the Mali king, uh, Abu Bakr II, when he traveled there with his forces, uh, were long before, like in, maybe two centuries before uh, uh, Christopher Columbus. And uh, the, the main issue that uh, the papacy uh, help with this uh, uh, exploration uh, and also uh, the um, uh, king and queens uh, of Europe uh, supporting these efforts because of uh, spreading of uh, Christianity uh, in whatever lands that they can find there. Um, uh, I wonder if uh, you, uh, your lecture have anything to do with this part of... Uh, uh, um, you know... Discovering uh, America. Uh, dis uh, discovering by America or, or also the East. Uh, spreading of Christianity and how much uh, the role uh, uh, of papacy played uh, in this uh, issue. I don't know, I, I, yeah. I'll try to say something about uh, the, uh, Professor Khalid Abu Khalid Abu Khair, Khair he is a professor a book, from uh, Taiba University in, uh, 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 in uh, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Medina, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. He, he, he wrote the book claiming, uh, the, did he uh, advance? Uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he, it's a work of 90, uh, uh, 900 days uh, of working where he uh, uh, make uh, uh, movies and also interviews a, a lot of people from uh, uh, Spain, pr Brazil, and the Mali, uh, um, Senegal, uh, to emphasize this fact. Uh, uh, I, I wonder if uh, Professor Dunch, uh, heard about him. Did you hear about that? It was an issue for two, uh, two years uh, uh, debate, in Saudi Arabia, you know. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Did he win the debate? Uh, mean, did he well, uh, uh, for me, yes, I, 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 I support him uh, okay. thoroughly. But uh, the <laughs> other uh, uh, colleague, no, they supported the fact, they st uh, still have to uh, emphasize the fact that, no, we have to stick with Columbus issue and uh, discovery better than going wild with Dr. Khalid Abul Khair. But I, I support him full this heartedly. Is, this is interesting. If I may just uh, make the comment and please <laughs> you try. Uh, and I'm a very, uh, I'm a lay person in this. But uh, I also, you know, Egyptians claim that they have been there before. Uh, uh, the Vikings also. I mean, uh, and uh, for if Dr. Khalid uh, did uh, do this study, it will be very interesting. Because if we talk about the Vikings, um, it's the 1900s. Okay. Yeah, that's a, 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 a earlier a period. Doctor, do you have anything? Uh, I mean, Vikings is 900, not 1900. 900. 900. 900. So Islam came later, yeah, no? Because the, the Spanish, oh. Spanish people, uh, Spaniards, uh, claim that they discovered the Vikings in 1900. Uh, some uh, remaining uh, from the Vikings, uh, because uh, the Viking, uh, 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 when they attacked the, the um, West, uh, they just attacked for uh, 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 looting and, uh, you know, and go, go back to uh, Denmark and uh, Norwich and, you know, <laughs> their places, but uh, not for uh, long staying or uh, settling there.
unlike the European, like the uh, uh, Spain and England, England and uh, later France. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, there are a lot of scholars putting forward advancing theories. If you can prove it scientifically, I'll go for it and raise my hat to that person. There is Thor Herdel, a Norwegian, um, who um, conducted what they call experimental archaeology, i.e. actually built a, um, a ship of reeds and sailed from Asafi, uh, Morocco, on the Atlantic, to the opposite side, which is um, uh, uh, one of the islands of Latin America, can't remember at the moment, and proved that the age of building with reeds, which goes 2,000, 3,000, five, well, 5,000 years ago, so. could be the case. But it doesn't mean that it happened. He proved it, but it doesn't mean, because we don't have the texts to prove. So this is one of the big problems. Um, uh, the, 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 the question of Marco Polo um, reporting about China, and Ibn Battuta, for that matter, reporting about China, um, as much as I, have, I would like to believe what they have said, and I'm sure there is a lot of truths, but there are, thank you, there is exaggeration. There may be also th things that were not actually eyewitnessed. And I think this is, uh, with, with, with all respect to what you think, um, uh, we, we, we scholars, we people in the academic field, we have to move with caution because we can believe anything and everything. And I, I, I think um, in, in, in terms of, of, of uh, um, spreading of Christianity, well, this is what, what Hindus did. This is what Buddhism did. Spreading in their missionary spirit and missionary zeal, they moved east to west. Same thing with Islam. In the spirit of Islam, they went, settled in the, in the name of Allah and did trade. And that's sanctioned by the Quran. And that is beautiful. And I think if we have got more examples of this kind of actual pragmatic uh, um, 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 uh, happenings, uh, I can't get the word in my head at the moment, I think we, 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 we can't move uh, to believe anything. I, 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 I would love to read the book. I mean, I, uh, you are a distinguished scholar. I, I, I mean, you, and you follow the academic standard operating. I, 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 it would be very nice to read. I mean, I, I don't know how I'll get a copy of it. But uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting question. Always well, ask that question. Thank you. That was yeah. nice. Thank you. Any any other question, please? Uh, yeah, the lady. <coughs> please introduce yourself. ممكن مرحبا أنا الدكتورة هدى عبد الغفور. أبى أسأل في فترة القرون الوسطى هل كانت هناك هجرات من الجزيرة العربية إلى الصين؟ Okay, thank you. شكرا. Can I answer in English? But yes, yeah. I, I, it, it, it's perfectly legitimate. The question is, was there any, any um, people who migrated uh, from the Arabian Peninsula to China? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, what I can say, and, uh, and it is um, documented in, in some detail, is Hadramis. People from Hadramaut, they, they settled in uh, Malabar, Calicut, and a lot of them went and settled in Southeast Asia. We do not know exactly the time, the when exactly, but we know for the past 300, 400 years, they already were there established. And some of them even came back recently in the, in the past uh, 100 years or 50 years. Um, but. Uh, uh, I, I, this, is, this is a very interesting question. You can guess that that was the case. Because, I mean, obviously, 
they were moving with trade and going and settling and marrying uh, local uh, wives. Shukran. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other question? I think we have a few minutes uh, left. Any question, comments? Oh? Sit. Mohammed, please. Briefly, actually, on that question. Yes, please um, do. I think aside from trade settlement and whatnot, there are two incidents in the early medieval period. Uh, one of them has very good records of migration, which was the Arab troops who came following the Li An Shan, uh, An Li Shan rebellion in the, during the Tang Dynasty period. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, this was supposedly a Turkic general who had rebelled against uh, the Tang Emperor. And uh, as part of sort of a cooperative military campaign, the Abbasids had sent around 15 to 20,000 troops. Of course, the figures could very well be exaggerated. What, what period is this? Hmm? Period? Uh, roughly the end of the 8th century. Uh, so this was one event of supposedly a mass migration of Arab troops from Central Asia. And the other one is that there is a myth that actually uh, Alawite Arabs had migrated and settled in Hainan Island. You know, and this is, there are some records of this, that there was a mass migration to that area escaping religious persecution. Now whether this is true or not is open to question. And these are separate from the actual traders who had settled in places like Zaytun, Chuanzhou, or Hanfu. Guangzhou. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me. To go back to your question, um, be before Islam, <coughs> there were, um, there were um, Arabians and Persians who settled in China, and also Christian Nestorians. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a, a stele, so how do you say it in Arabic, Hajar? بال 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 بالكتابة، sorry النحت يا النحت نحت yes yes that's right in China don't ask me where but I remember reading it which suggests that already there is a presence before Islam came and that Islam strengthened that trade trading post Shian that's it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I mentioned it in the book, but I couldn't remember it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is good. Uh, sure. Our colleague, Mohammed Sudari, I didn't ask him to introduce himself. He actually speaks fluent Chinese. Uh -huh. And he's, uh -huh. okay, good Chinese. He's doing his PhD. He's a candidate. In I, I, um, I, um, I, I was surprised. I, I have to say this publicly. Yesterday, I was introduced to him. I haven't, I remained with my mouth open. Oh, God. I said, <laughs> finally, there is somebody who could actually access those sources that I have been always dreaming of doing, but I don't know the language. So, nice. Thank you. you make, thank you very much for coming, and please, uh, one more welcome. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.